Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Perkelhammer. So today I have the pleasure of welcoming Bobby Miller, also known as Humble Fish. What's happening there, Bobby? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you today? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing well, man. Um, just a little background. I know a lot of you folks do know Bobby, but just for those that do not, Bobby has been in the saltwater aquarium hobby since 1978. I think you got me, uh, me beat there, man. Um, being in the hobby for so long has provided him the opportunity to keep just about every type of marine system possible. In addition, Bobby has worked in retail, maintenance, and most recently owned and operated Humble Fish Aquatics, which sold quarantined conditioned saltwater fish. Around 15 years ago, Bobby decided to devote himself to the fish disease and treatment aspect of our hobby, and this is considered his area of expertise. He also owns and operates Humble.Fish and Reef Community, an aquarium forum which is dedicated to helping fellow hobbyists. But before we start chatting with Bobby, I want to thank the sponsors for this show, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting the live stream. And I also appreciate all you folks out there tuning in. I see there's a bunch of you finding the stream. Please hit the like button if you haven't already so more folks can find the stream. And as per usual, I always encourage comments, questions in the chat. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, questions for Bobby tonight. But um, yeah, so Bobby, man, um, I'm I'm excited to talk to you because this is uh, you know we're gonna kind of focus on on fish uh, quarantining. But um, how did it uh, all begin for you? I mean, I mentioned 1978. How did how did you uh, begin your reef keeping journey? So I was actually five years old, and my my father was in the hobby before I was, and I guess I just was uh, bugging him too much. I was you know trying to help him with his aquariums. And I'll never forget it. He finally one day, you know, one Saturday morning, he said, OK, he said, we're going to set up a new tank today. And, then, you know, back then it was like a 29 gallon with uh, undergravel filter and crushed coral substrate and, you know, the, the, the dead coral skeletons for, you know, decorations. And he helped me set the tank up and, you know, helped me cycle it. And he said, OK, he said, here's the deal. He said, uh, 
you're going to learn how to take care of this all by yourself or you're going to lose the tank. Mm. So mm. my dad was he's he's retired military. So he's kind of, you know, one of those hardcore type people. And uh, that's how I got into it. And I just had to learn even at five, six years old, everything I had to learn to take care of that tank, because if I wasn't successful, I knew that my father would take the aquarium away from me. And that's how it started for me. So obviously you were uh, successful because uh, you were uh, continuing on from five years old. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, obviously, you know, as I grew up, had a lot of different aquariums. Uh, then when I was in high school, I uh, worked for a local fish store. Uh, later on, I worked in uh, maintenance um, and then, you know, uh, just recently operated Humblefish Aquatics, which was I want it's not the first, but one of the first businesses to sell fully quarantine conditioned fish. Now there's tons of companies out there doing it. So. Um, yeah, I've kind of worked, you know, it's both as a hobbyist and both in the retail side of the, uh, of the hobby, the industry. I mean, looking back, what's, what's been your favorite part? You know what? I, you, I know a lot of people look, I, I, I like reef tanks, but I really miss kind of the eighties, like the 1980s and the early nineties where you could really just get any and any kind of fish that you wanted. There were, there weren't all those restrictions and, it was just easy to get any species you wanted. And I just like those those fowler tanks, you know, the fish only tanks. Probably my favorite were predator tanks. Mm. I mean, there's just something for me about, you know, a nice, you know, a tank with like triggers and groupers and and puffer fish and, you know, just that predator tank that you can uh you can feed and just kind of watch all that action. You know, that that's probably my favorite uh thing. You know, my speaking of predator fish, my my favorite fish when I was like first getting into this hobby. And going onto local fish stores was the um, clown trigger, right? Is that the clown trigger? I mean, that that thing has got like the most incredible, distinct markings. It looks so mm -hmm. freaking cool, and I always wanted to keep a clown trigger, and I never, uh, I never had, uh, you know, I never had a, a fish only tank to to do that. But those things are just to me like the bomb. It's it's so cool, and and yeah, that would be kind of neat to have a uh, fish only tank. I just wish I had the time to take care of another tank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it comes down. Yeah, the clown triggers are really cool because you know they start out, you can buy them now, little bitty, almost babies. And I mean, it takes them no time to get to, you know, eight, nine inches. I mean, in a matter of maybe two or three years, you know, so you kind of can get this little baby fish in and, you know, two, three years later, you've got this eight, nine, you know, inch monster, you know, so... Yeah, they're really cool. So I don't know if you're looking at the chat, but you got uh, Paul B is uh, is watching. He's already thrown out the first <laughs> salvo there. I was a much better looking guest than you, Bobby. Uh oh, uh, we're we're starting <laughs> up now. It's getting it's getting real here. Um, what was the? Uh, oh yeah, Michael Bazzi. Bobby, are you going to straighten out Paul B from last week? Question mark with a smiley face. <laughs> You know, it's weird where Paul and I are actually really good friends. Uh, I actually met him for the first time. Uh, it was actually this summer. Uh, went to Long Island. My wife and I we spent a couple of weeks there and uh, got to meet Paul. And I mean, we, we obviously have very different methods and ideologies, but just a great guy. I love Paul. Um, I think he's great. Well, we'll uh, we'll kind of get into the to, to some of the stuff that Paul was talking about. I know you have some different opinions about it, but um I don't know. Maybe the best way to start off tonight, since we're going to be talking about fish quarantining and all that stuff, is can you just like give us a real quick, um, you know, primer on the different fish diseases, like the most popular and the most common in the hobby? Just, um, you know, maybe the top three, four or five that we need to be concerned about. So probably first and foremost is marine ick. You know, that's the one that, uh, you know, most people are familiar with. That's, you know, where you see the, the white dots on the fish, which, you know, I just want to point out. That's not actually the parasite you're seeing. That's actually the fish's immune response to the parasite. So what happens is when they're uh, afflicted with, with the parasite, then their immune system releases and it basically white mucus forms around the parasite and that's the visible symptom. So that's the one most people are familiar with. Um, there's a similar parasite. It's a lot more deadly called marine velvet disease. Yeah. Uh, there, it's more of like a dusting. It's, it's white dots on the fish, but more of a dusting. I tell people typically if you can count the white dots on the fish, it's ick. If they're too numerous, it's velvet. Uh, velvet is a lot more difficult to manage, um, you know, in a display tank. It's, it's just a lot deadlier. Um, every, I think every velvet tomo can release 200 free swimmers, which actively seek out fish to infect. 
Um, another big one is Brooklynella, which is uh, a lot of people know that is clownfish disease. That's the when clownfish got get the white dust on them, and also when the fish is heavily infected, they'll actually like you'll see white mucus, like stringy white mucus coming off the clownfish. Uh, Brooklynella, Brooklynella is primarily uh, clownfish are afflicted by it. It's for some reason. The other disease is uronema, which is the red sores that you'll sometimes see on chromis and antheus. Again, that seems to be more of a species-specific type disease. Uh, chromis are, are heavily affected by it, sometimes antheus. Um, and the other one is flukes. Hmm. Uh, these are actually worms that get on the fish, and they're, they're tricky because um, they're translucent, so you don't actually see them on the fish unless it's a, a dark-colored fish. Um, so usually you have to go with like behavioral symptoms, like heavy breathing, scratching. If a fish has, uh, flukes in their gills, they'll sometimes yawn or twitch their head. So those are probably like the top five diseases that most hobbyists will encounter and have to deal with. And then, then there's others, you know, there's, there's bacterial infections that fish can get and, uh, uh just a slew of other diseases. I mean, you stop and think about it. You know, as humans, we probably have hundreds, if not thousands of different diseases that we can get. Well, the same applies to fish. I mean, they're no different. So we're just basically dealing with maybe at most a dozen or, you know, or so diseases that are the most common that we, we help hobbyists um, treat and diagnose. What about something where you, you, you would have a fish that um, is, um, is eating or it, um, it, it, it's eating for a while and then it stops eating and, and you can kind of notice it's losing weight? It starts losing color, but there's no visible signs of any, um, you know, parasites on it. Is is that uh, just kind of one of those diseases that, um, you know, might not be as common as the others that you're talking about? And then it's just it could be a number of different things. So that that can be a number of different things. Um, so if a fish if a fish is eating, but it's continuing to lose weight yeah. and especially you see a pinched stomach and the other um, uh, symptom is white stringy feces. That can be a sign of intestinal parasites or intestinal worms. Um, it, it can be either or. Basically, there's either worms or parasites inside the fish's intestines or basically eating the fish from the inside out. Um, what's tricky about it is if they're worms, they can be treated with, with prosy, prosyquantol, which is the same thing, medication we use to treat flukes. But if they're internal parasites or internal flagellates, then there's a medication called metronidazole, uh, that's typically used to treat those. And both of those medications can be soaked in food. So a marine biologist once told me, and it's true, that every for everything you see that can go wrong on the outside with a fish it can also go wrong on the inside. So that's kind of where you get, you know, intestinal worms and internal parasites. And uronema, for instance, can actually uh, actually be in the fish's bloodstream and in their cells. So, so you mentioned that you could put this uh, medication in food. Is there any... Any, um, you know, cause for concern about putting that medicated food into a reef tank and impacting the corals in your tank? So what you would want to do is you would want to use like a, a binder to bind the medication to the food so it doesn't leach out into the water and possibly affect your corals. Uh, Seachem makes a product called Seachem Focus, which is exactly that's what it does. You add that to the to the food mix to bind the medication to the food. Uh, you can also use agar or you can use unflavored gelatin. All three of those will allow you to, to bind the medication to the food so it doesn't harm your corals and inverts. Um, just looking at the chat here. So, um, first of all, how did you get into the, uh, to the whole fish disease thing? I mean, was that just something that uh, you just decided to you know, really focus on because you had a big interest in that or you just had a lot of issues with fish staying healthy and you wanted to kind of um, solve those issues? How, how did, Bobby, how did you get into this whole thing and become, you know, a, a, an expert on, on fish disease and treatment? So I used to work for an aquarium maintenance company. And one of the things I did was I, I quarantined all their new fish. So all the new fish that we got in from the wholesalers and transshippers, it was my responsibility to quarantine all the fish before we sold the fish to our clients. Um, but then I, I worked for that company for a while and then I, it was kind of weird. Like I was really into quarantining then, but then I kind of got out of quarantining and I kind of went back. I haven't always quarantined and I kind of went back to, well, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to run a UV sterilizer, feed garlic, that kind of thing. 
Um, so I actually got out of the hobby for about three years. My wife and I lived overseas. And when I came back and I got in the hobby, I just kind of went back to doing what I did. You know, I, I didn't quarantine. Um, and I mean, for like a year, I got my butt handed to me. I mean, I could not keep a fish alive. I mean, I was constantly losing fish to various diseases, uh, ick, flukes, velvet, all of the, the, my old ways, my ways of doing things, um, actually they weren't working anymore. So I kind of came to a point where I said, you know what, I, you know, I either need to figure this out and I need to change my methods, my ways, or I need to get out of this hobby because I'm not going to kill fish. And that kind of put me on the path to studying fish diseases and, um, I was actually surprised how little information was out there and how limited the treatment options were. And you know how like something kind of becomes an obsession? Yeah. That's what happened. It just took it took me over and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna get to the bottom of this and I'm not gonna rest until I figure out everything there is to know about fish diseases and treatment. And that was like maybe oh, that's been about 16, 17 years ago. And it's just been what I do ever since then. No, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you kind of, um, you, you kind of, it, it's, it's like trying to solve a puzzle, right? And some people are very, um, you know, very regimented that way and, and want to be able to, I mean, I'm like that. I want to understand everything, you know, that's going on. And, and, and it's tough with a reef tank because there's just so many things that uh, are hard to understand. But um, yeah, in terms of the pests in this hobby and disease, whether it's coral or fish, there's so many different things out there. And um you know, it's all about the animals, right? And, and taking care of the animals to the best possible uh, degree that you can. So, um, you know, you and I were talking before the, uh, the show, I've never quarantined fish and, you know, I've had, I've had my share of fish losses. So, um, but you know, I do have a, uh, I, I did set up a, a little while ago, a, um, a coral quarantine tank and it, and it is, uh, you know, it's extra work, it's extra work to keep that thing running. But, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll kind of get into what you would recommend in terms of a, uh, a fish uh, quarantine tank. I saw a question here from um, I might uh, hopefully I pronounce this uh, correctly. Uh, too high, too he can sea chem focus bind to live brine. I have a mandarin that I suspect internal parasites. Yeah, you you can use focus. Um, it can bind to um, pellets. Um, it can bind to, I mean, it binds best to pellets, but then, you know, a lot of times fish, um, that are sick, especially they they won't eat pellet food. Um, so if you can't get the fish to eat pellets, you can try binding it to live food or something like mysis or frozen brine or something like that. Um, it's not like a hundred percent, like it's going to bind every little bit of the medication. You're still going to lose some to the water, but it's usually enough where it's still effective and you don't harm your corals or inverts. But yeah, you can definitely use it for live brine shrimp. So Bert Minshew has uh, got an interesting question. Best question to help everyone before quarantine. Um, Bobby's thoughts on pH change from shipping, toxifying, ammonia. Should you add a little prime when opening the bag? So it kind of depends where the fish is coming from. Um, if, if, you know, okay, so just as a hobbyist, if you're getting a fish like you're ordering a fish online, um, if the fish hasn't been in transit for too long, we'll just say under 24 hours, then uh, the pH shouldn't be a concern. The, the water should still be alkaline. Um, however, you do have to worry about ammonia. So what I try to tell people, this is just the best thing to do, I find, especially if you're going to quarantine, find out the, um, the salinity that the, um, whoever you're buying from, the salinity they're, that they're going to ship the fish in. Set your quarantine tank to match. So then when you get the fish in, you just basically you float the bag to temperature acclimate and then basically you can open up the bag and you can just put the fish right in. You don't have to do a drip acclimation. Mm -hmm. um, the only time that that pH really becomes a concern is if you're getting fish from a transshipper um, and the fish is in transit for several days. Well, in that case, then the pH will become acidic. And that's a whole mess where you have to take hours and hours to slowly you know, put the fish in like a vat and slowly raise the pH to neutral and then from neutral to alkaline water. But for most hobbyists, um, um, it's not an issue. If you do need to drip acclimate, yeah, I, I would definitely use prime after 30 minutes because what happens is any ammonium in the bag water will convert to toxic ammonia within 30 minutes. Um, so I would use prime, but I would use prime sparingly 
because prime will also drop the pH of the bag water. So you don't want that. You know, you don't want the water to be neutral or acidic. What uh, what's the best protocol? Let's say you do order a fish online and it's you know in transit for uh, I don't know eighteen hours or whatever typical is in terms of uh, you know next day uh, air. What uh, what's the best protocol? You know, I've always gone under the assumption that you should float the bag with the fish for about thirty minutes and then do a, a thirty minute drip acclimation. Is that um, is that something that uh, is is okay or is there a a, a better basic type of process that you would recommend doing? So if, if salinity matches, you know, like I said, if, if salinity of the bag water in the tank, the fish is going into, if it matches or if it's within like a, a point or two, then yeah, you don't, you don't have to do any drip acclimation. You can just float the bag, temperature acclimate, put the fish right in. Um, fish are not really all that sensitive to pH swings so long as the water is alkaline. You know, as long as the pH is above 7, then they can go from like 7.1, 7.2 into 8.2, and that's not going to be an issue. Um, if you do need – if you do need – so, okay, so drip acclimation. Fish have a have a much easier time going down in salinity than they do in going up. So let's just say you got in a fish that's um, at like, say, you know, 1.025 or 24 and you need to put the uh, the fish into a quarantine tank that's set at like 1.020, the specific gravity. Well, again, you wouldn't have to drip acclimate because, you know, the fish is going down in salinity. They can tolerate that just fine. However, most online retailers, and I know most wholesalers, ship fish. They're usually around like 0 .018, 0 .019. Mm -hmm. Most of us keep our reef tanks at like, you know, 1.02526. That in that scenario, you would have to drip acclimate. Um, you would have to basically take, um, um, you know, put the fish in like a, a bucket or something. I run an air stone, temperature control the water because you're looking at probably several hours of having to drip acclimate that fish to raise that fish into the higher salinity. Um, and the main thing is you do want to dose prime because you want to control the ammonia. The only exception to that is be sure wherever the fish is coming from, they did not ship the fish in uh, copper water because prime will turn copper toxic. Ooh. Right. That's, a, so, yeah, yeah. that's an important point. Right. Well, which is, is, is a tricky question because so prime will turn copper sulfate, which most dealers use, or cupramine toxic. However, prime is safe to use with chelated copper, like copper safe and copper power. So it also matters what type of copper the dealer is using and if they ship the fish in copper in the bag water, which some do, some don't. So Manny's Reef um, has got a, a relevant question. You just me mentioned uh, Cooper, Cooper teen, uh, Coopermine. Um, please ask this. Why don't any of the quarantine guide choose uh, Coopermine? They all have copper power or copper safe. So what happened was... Um, so most dealers use copper sulfate pentahydrate, which that's not, that's, I guess, not relevant to this. But so before cupramine came along, we were all, all of us old salts or whatever, we, that quarantine, we were using copper safe, which is chelated copper. Now there's copper safe and copper power. They're basically the same thing. They're both different forms of chelated copper. And then cupramine came out and they're like, hey, this stuff is so much better and it's less toxic and, you know, well, everybody needs to use this, you know, as a marketing thing. So we we're like, okay, let's all give it a try. Well, honestly, at least my experience was I was losing a lot more fish in Coopermine than I ever was uh, when I was using Copper Safe. So after about a year, I'm like, I'm going back to, to Chile to Copper. So, you know, it's all anecdotal, but it seems like fish tolerate Chile to Copper which is copper safe and copper power better than ionic copper, which is cupramine. Um, it's, I just feel like chelated copper is a better product. It's, um, it's, it's more well tolerated than cupramine by more, more species of fish, especially like wrasses and other fish that are, are angel fish that are sensitive to copper. So, uh, all right, let's, um, let's get into your, um, your recommendation there, Bobby, in terms of a basic, uh, quarantine setup. So we, we kind of like have touched on in terms of, you know, what you typically should do when you, when you, um, are acclimating a fish to a system. 
What um, what would you recommend in terms of the size of a uh, quarantine tank? You know, the the equipment in there, uh, heater, light, whatever. Uh, you know, what what um, what's kind of like a basic quarantine setup that you think is a good thing for most reef keepers? So there's a lot of different ways. Like for example, if you were going to do tank transfer method, you would want to use small basic quarantine tanks. But I'll just for this purpose, I'll just describe like a general quarantine tank. So I really like like a like a 29 or 30 gallon um, quarantine tank. Uh, for example, they Acreon makes a 29 gallon, which has the same footprint as a 20 long, but it's just a little bit taller. Gives the fish, you know, the fish more uh, more space, more water volume. Um, so basically, you would set the tank up. You you can put sand. You know, sand does not absorb medications as badly as rock. You can put a little bit of sand down if you want. You can go bare bottom if you prefer. Uh, for hiding spots, uh, we usually prefer the PVC uh, elbows that you know you'll see in quarantine tanks because they're inert and they won't absorb copper. Um, so you would want to have those for hiding places for the fish. You would want a heater. You would want a thermometer. Um, you would want a um, I use a Seachem ammonia alert badge because that will uh, detect ammonia even in the presence of medications. But the most 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 important thing is to have a good working biofilter on the quarantine tank because ammonia is probably the number one killer of fish in quarantine. So there's three different HOBs that I like. Um, there's Aqua Clear, uh, the, the bot, you know, the old uh, Aqua Clear. Seachem makes a title uh, HOB power filter, which is similar. And you probably remember the old bio wheel. Yeah. Those work great for quarantine. Any, any one of those three work great. Um, they will give you, um, you know, flow in the tank and also, you actually then want to seed it. So like with the bio wheel, the the media is actually the bio wheel itself. With the Seachem and with the Tidal, uh, they have sponges and they also have like, uh, I think the Seachem Tidal comes with Seachem matri uh, Matrix. And before you ever put fish in this tank, before you add medications, you want to seed the quarantine tank with live nitrifying bacteria. There's a lot of different products out there. The one that I have found works most consistently is Fritz Biozyme. I'm sorry, Fritz Turbo Start. Mm -hmm. uh, see that the live bacteria in the quarantine tank for a few days before adding fish. And then what you do is instead of, you know, in, in a DT, we use live rock for biological filtration. You would have live bacteria seeded in that HOB to help process ammonia. So you don't have to worry about that in quarantine because, again, ammonia is probably the number one killer of fish in quarantine. And that that's a basic quarantine setup that. I think would you know work for most people. Is that a setup that you can set up and break down and then set it up when you need it, or is that a setup that um, you should, you know, keep running? I mean, and and I'll go ahead and answer that question first. I got another follow up. Um, yeah, you, I, I recommend setting it up and breaking it down as needed for this reason. So the longer, it, it's ironic. You need you need bacteria to help process ammonia. However, you don't want too much bacteria in the quarantine tank because bacteria actually um, actually biodegrades medications, non-copper medications. So if you have to use like praziquantel, metronidazole, antibiotics in the quarantine tank, too much bacteria will actually biodegrade those medications. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is actually break down the quarantine tank, you know, in in, in between batches of fish, reset it up. Now. People are going to say, well, so you mean to tell me I've got to buy this Fritz Turbo Start every single time I quarantine? Not necessarily. If you will just take, like, we'll just use the, the bio wheel or we'll use the, the sponge that comes in, the, um, um, in, the, in the, the, the power filter I described. If you will just take those and put them in the DT of your sump, uh, your sump's the, um, the display tank sump, yeah. and you leave it there for months, enough bacteria will transfer from your display tank onto that media you can just reuse that in uh in quarantine for biological filtration because i have a um in my coral quarantine tank i have a uh, an aqua clear hang on the back filter and and the um you know the filter sponges are about yay you know they're about three inches uh, long and maybe two inches wide or something like that they don't it doesn't seem to be that big of a sponge I mean, and and the way the way I do it I, I keep that tank running all the time i have to like live rock in there and i'm not putting like um you know, um, any meds in there that's going to kill the bacteria. I, I, I use that, um, I'll do dips and put the, uh, frags, uh, in the dips and then take, take them out quarantine, dip them, put them back in the quarantine. 
hit it with like some uh, interceptor stuff and for, for bugs. But um, so that's enough. That uh, that sponge and the hang in the back filter is enough to populate, uh, to, to have enough of the, uh, the bacteria. What about um, also using established tank water to start that quarantine tank up? Is that something you would recommend doing? Or are you talking about brand new, you know, mixed fresh salt water and then seeding it with that bacteria with the uh, sponge and the hang in the back filter? I mean, you can use DT water. I'm just of the opinion that that the water itself contains minimal um, live nitrifying bacteria. You know, most of the bacteria, you know, in our DTs, it's either in the sand or in the rock because um, it needs like a place yeah. to, to colonize. So that's why, like, you know, so, in, in, for example, what you were saying, you have the um, the AquaClear power filter with the sponges. If you bought extra sponges and just stuck it down in your um, uh, your DT sump, then the bacteria that's in the water would colonize on that and then begin pr begin to propagate inside the sponge or on the surface of the sponge. Uh, and you could use that for biological fil filtration and QT. Same thing with your, you know, if you, you do happen to have a, um, a coral QT, like you said, you've got you're running an aqua clear filter. If you trusted it, um, you could use the sponge out of that. Um, it it just needs to be enough nitrifying bacteria either on the surface or inside the sponge, so as the water passes through it, and when it makes contact with the ammonia, you know you've got the nitrification process going on, and it's converting it to nitrates. And 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 so you need to do some testing before you're adding fish in there to make sure that that tank is. Uh cycled and doesn't have any of the ammonia in there that's going to be toxic to the fish i i tell people a good a good rule of thumb is um you can dose ammonia and dose 2 ppm ammonia in 24 hours you should only see nitrates you should see no like the ammonia should be completely processed out the nitrites should be completely processed out you should only get a nitrate reading if you get that in 24 hours you have a healthy uh, quarantine biofilter to, to add fish to. Let's say you, um, you miscalculate and, um, you put the fish in the, uh, the tank thinking that it's, um, it's ready at, you know, as a quarantine setup. What, what are some of the signs that you're going to be looking for, you know, for fish that are, um, distressed, you know, inside of that quarantine tank that something's not right? So are we talking like uh, that they're being exposed to ammonia? Or there's yeah, diseases? yeah. I mean, any any signs that uh, not necessarily they're coming in with disease. Let, let's just say that the quarantine tank is not ready for prime time. What uh, what you sh what what kind of like quick signs should you be looking for in the fish? Like heavy breathing. Yeah. So if if a fish comes in contact with ammonia, yeah, you'll see heavy breathing. Uh, they'll scratch their gills. Their gills will be irritated. The gills are always where you know that's the most sensitive part of the fish. Um, also, the gills will become inflamed, and you will also sometimes see like a reddening around the gills, around the gill slits. So, yeah, look look for the heavy breathing, look for the scratching, and look for the redness around the gill slits. And if you see that there's a, that the uh, that there's ammonia in the quarantine tank, and you need to either you know do an ammonia, do a water change, or dose like prime or something, or you know to get that because uh, fish are very intolerant of ammonia. So Trevor Hiller says, um, I used a Fluval sponge from Petco that was $1.99 as a bacteria source. I left it in my display tank for three weeks, and it worked perfectly. I believe they are intended for uh, AquaClear hang in the back filters. Yep. Yeah, it's all you have to do. I mean, you, you can, you know, if you need to set up a QT on the fly, like I said, you can use a bacteria in a bottle product. But if, if you, you know, time it and you have time to put the, the sponge like in the DT sump, I mean, it does the same thing. You're just waiting for that bacteria to transfer onto the sponge and begin propagating. So um, Sammy31D has a, um, a question. I just set up a dozen small tanks to s sell small fish from, all individual filters, no shared water. I occasionally use Prozzi Pro as a preventative and have copper power for stronger cases. Of confir confirmed uh, illnesses. Any suggestions for a great, safely run preventative measure in terms of a retail type of environment? So, like, I'm guessing, uh, like, like a basic quarantine to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, so, what I recommend, and this takes care of most uh, problems, is um, to okay. We'll just say it's just one quarantine tank. Uh, run copper power, or copper safe at 2.5 ppm for 30 days. Um, during the first 10 days of quarantine, I recommend dosing metronidazole 
um, every 48 hours for the first 10 days. So copper only treats thick and velvet. A lot of people think copper is a cure-all. It's actually not. It treats thick and velvet. Metronidazole um, will treat um, Brooklynella. And if the fish happen to have internal flagellates, they, they'll drink the medicated water. It will help with that. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to deworm with, with Prozzi, with Prozzi Pro. Um, you would dose Prozzi Pro twice over about a, you know, once, and then you wait five to seven days, dose it again. The only problem with mixing Prozzi Pro with copper is sometimes uh, the interaction causes a bacterial bloom. The water gets very cloudy, and if the water gets too cloudy, cloudy that actually starves all the oxygen out of the water, and you can you can basically kill the fish that way. Hmm. So you have to be a little bit careful um, when you're using Prozzi Pro with copper. I tell most people it would be better to wait until after copper is over with, do the water changes, get the copper out of the water, and then use Prozzi Pro. Um, but mo- a lot of people combine them, and it usually works out. Um. Uh, Paul, but does, um, Paul B. just uh, made a comment about uh, using pennies for copper. Can I use Prime with that? Uh, no, I would not use uh, um, – if you're putting pennies in your tank for copper, I would not use Prime with that. Should Paul, <laughs> yep. Paul, should Paul just uh, ditch the idea about using pennies? I know he was, uh, using, uh, he was using a ton of pennies at one point in time. <laughs> Yeah, Paul. You know what? Paul has a very. But you know, he uh, listen. You know, the guy uh, had has had great success over the years, so it's kind of tough to argue with what uh, you know his track record. So I have a theory about Paul's tank. You know, so nobody really knows for sure why Paul is able not to quarantine. Why he uh, he you know he just puts fish right in. He doesn't quarantine. I have a theory. His his tank has been set up for so long that he think of the biodiversity in that tank. Now everything's got predators. So all these parasites and worms that we're talking about, they have natural predators. But for people that are setting up a, a brand new tank, especially you know nowadays dry rock is a big thing. Everybody wants to use dry rock. You don't really have the biodiversity in the tank to, to have these natural predators of parasites and worms. Paul has a tank that's 50-something years old. He's probably very likely, likely got strains of bacteria or other things in there that are actually natural predators that probably eat the parasites. He also is very big on nutrition. Uh, he, fee- he only feeds his fish like clams and, and muzzles and, 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 and live uh, white worms and black worms. So that, what that does is you're, by doing that, you're actually you're, you're feeding the, the fish's gut flora, and the gut flora then uh, is what powers the fish's immune system. So he's got extremely healthy fish. The problem with a lot, especially new hobbyists, they don't always do that. Mm. You know, they, they feed flake food, they feed pellets, and those are not necessarily the most nutritional things to feed a, a fish to help fuel their immune system. Right. He was talking about gut bacteria, and that the, that's basically what he's adding via the food, the, the, the seafood that he's adding to the, uh, to the fish tank. Yes, yes. And, that, and don't get me wrong. If, if no matter what you do, that is the best thing to do. I mean— we all have to feed flake food or pellets sometimes because, you know, we're in a hurry. But if at all possible, you are you really should be trying to, to replicate, duplicate whatever, what the fish eat in the ocean. And what they eat in the ocean is they eat other fish. They eat shrimp. They eat clams, you know. And that's why I'm a, a proponent of uh, feeding mostly frozen food and like live food, like live black worms or live baby brine shrimp or live white worm cultures. Again, anything that contains bacteria – that will um, will will feed the fish's gut flora, which then in turn powers their immune system. So in th- that situation, you have extremely healthy fish with a heightened immune system that are in a better position to to deal with parasites and worms and pathogens in the water. Yeah, you know, I, I make uh, my own homemade fish and coral food. I, I, I go to the supermarket. I buy some cheap seafood, you know, scallops, um, some white meat uh, fish. Silver sides, I'll add in some silver sides, some um, garlic extract, some um, uh, what else? Garlic powder, I think, and and I mean it's it's like a whole mishmash of stuff in there, shrimp, whatever I can find, and then uh, I'll just put it in a um, you know like a meat grinder and grind it all up, and I also put some brine shrimp cubes in there and mysa shrimp um, cubes, so I'll you know I'll make a whole bunch of that stuff, 
and freeze it up into sheets. And then I, you know, so I'll just kind of break off chunks and feed the, uh, the fish that one time per day. And then I also feed um, brine shrimp cubes and mice shrimp cubes during another feeding. But I also do feed um, pellets. So it sounds to me like pellets and flake food to, to you, what, you know, what I'm hearing from you is like the, not the most nutritious. It's more of a um, kind of a, a quick hit for fish. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, look, we don't, we always don't have the time to thaw out um, a frozen food and feed our fish. We're on the go. We're late for work, whatever. So yeah, in that situation, sometimes you have to throw some flake food or uh, some pellets. And you know what? There are some better pellets on the market. I think, I think it's Reef Nutrition makes that, that Chroma Boost. That, yes. That's a very good um, uh, pellet food to use. But I, I look at pellets and flake as sort of a supplemental thing. You know, like I said, fish need you know, raw, they need seafood, they need live food. And, you know, your, your herbivores need nori, um, on a daily basis. All these things help to basically power their immune system. Yeah. I, I have, um, sheets of nori that, um, I don't like, like to leave them on clips because it just seems like a lot of times when I put the, uh, the nori on a clip in the tank, I've got, you know, I got a couple of, a uh, few different tanks that, um, uh, you know, not all the fish are getting it. One fish will rip off the uh, the nori from the clip. So I just kind of like hand feed the uh, the nori, and that seems to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those grids? Yeah, they they have yeah those, those roller grid things, and you can put the nori around that and rubber band it, and that kind of helps more fish to get it, and you don't lose as much to the water. But yeah, I know tanks can make a mess of nori; it gets everywhere. What about the um, diversity of the fish population in a reef tank? You know, is is that um, I, I like to keep her, herbivores, uh, you know, like tangs and whatnot. They're kind of like, you know, they, they're, they're the worker bees, I think, in a reef tank in terms of keeping, uh, you know, algae at bay. And, and I guess if you have a sand bed, grasses will help to kind of keep the sand bed. Do you have like a certain, you know, uh, set type of fish that you like to keep in your, uh, in, your, in your tanks? I know right now you don't have any uh, tanks, but uh, in the past, have you, you know, kind of kept a, a good variety of fish? Is that something that we should all, as uh, you know, reef keepers, think about? Kind of planning out our, um, you know, the fish that we have in the tanks. In my opinion, every fish should have a job. So every fish should have sort of a reason for being in the tank. Something that you need to to do. Like for example, if you've got bubble algae or other nuisance algae in the tank, and you have a large enough tank, get a rabbit fish. You know, they're they're great for you know for eating nuisance algae. Uh, you know, tangs, a lot of tangs, especially like the bristle tooth tangs are really good for getting like, you know, algae in like tight spots. Um, if you've got Aptasia, then, you know, get a, a file fish or, you know, a copper band butterfly are great for those. So basically, and not every single fish is going to have a job, but like, you know, for example, if, if you have cyano on the sand bed or just your sand isn't as white um, as you would like it, you know, get a, um, a sand sifting goby. So it's kind of like you with those different fish and they each have their job, you kind of create like a, a balance in the tank and your tank looks its best without you having to put your hands in the tank. And I mean, everybody wants a tank they can just put on autopilot. So mm -hmm. if fish have jobs, they're helping you to maintain the looks of the tank without you having to put your hands in the tank. That's one of my other big things. It's like I tell people, if you can keep your hands out of the tank, you know, yes. I mean, we all have to clean. Yeah, yeah, we have to wipe down the algae, but I know so many people that are in there and they're moving corals around and tinkering with things, and a lot of times they're doing more harm than good. Yes, keep the hands out of the tank. That is a, a mantra that I try to follow because the oils of the skin are going to get in there. And, and uh, oh. plus, you know, if you, for, for corals themselves, you just keep moving a coral, you know, every uh, couple of weeks, it's not going to have a chance to kind of uh, take hold. Um, so we had, a, there's kind of a little bit of a, a debate going on in the chat here. What are Bobby's thoughts on six to eight week observation versus treatment with meds? So, you know, what, 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 what do you think about that in terms of instead of like putting, you know, taking a fish and putting it in a quarantine tank and start, start treating with meds, what about just observing it? Is that good enough? So in my opinion, that depends more on the person than the fish. So I tell people, you know, if, okay, so a lot of people like they don't want to use meds. They want to do is just called an observational quarantine where you just watch the fish for diseases. If the fish doesn't display any symptoms, the fish is good to go. If the fish displays symptoms, you treat. And in my opinion, that is only good for some, someone who I guess we say has uh, clo pays close attention to detail. Hmm. 
So, because not all not all symptoms of diseases are visible. You know, I mean, it's it's easy when you see ick on a fish, you see the white dots, or you see you know this or that. But a lot of the symptoms that we look for in quarantine are actually behavioral symptoms: uh, scratching, um, head twitching, uh, you know, flashing, um, yawning. Like yawning and head twitching can be symptoms of of uh, flukes or parasites in the gills. Um, a fish that has marine velvet disease, for instance, will try to swim into the flow of like a power head or a wave maker. So it, it, if you have the time to sit in front of your quarantine tank, we'll just say 30 minutes every day, and you are astute about uh, picking up on these behavioral symptoms of disease and then treating, then I think an observational quarantine tank will work for you. However, a lot of people have busy lives, you know, they're juggling, you know, work and and family and they're just not home a lot or they're not really able to sit in front of the quarantine tank and watch the fish. And I think for those people, then I think it makes sense to do uh, what I call prophylactic um, quarantine, where you're using medications like copper, um, prosy, um, metronidazole prophylactically um, because you just don't have the time to um, sit in front of the quarantine tank. What I used to do um, sounds kind of silly. My wife didn't appreciate it. I used to eat dinner with my fish. So as I'm sitting there, you know, the fish in quarantine, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm eating dinner and I'm just, while I'm enjoying my meal, I'm watching my fish in quarantine. I did this every single day to, uh, observe for any symptoms of fish. So if you can do that, then yeah, by all means, you don't have to use medications, but you know, if, if you're always on the go or you're a busy person, then and you just you just know you're not going to have the time to sit there and, and stare at a quarantine tank for 30 minutes a day, then you might want to consider at least some prophylactic use of, of medications. What what would be the ideal um, you know quarantining process in terms of the number of weeks and the med, the meds that you would use in a um, you know in a quarantine tank? Uh, you know, it's just kind of um, the the best the best. Um, I guess there's there's a lot of different options that you could uh, you could. Uh, choose, but uh, what would you say would be the, the ones you would recommend for somebody that's just kind of like starting out with quarantining fish? So if you're using just, we'll just say just one quarantine tank, because there is a, you, there's an abbreviated version if you can transfer the fish from a quarantine tank into an observation tank. Let's just run with a person just has one tank to use. So when you get the fish in, uh, the first medication you probably want to use is copper, because most fish that are coming from dealers are either going to have ick or velvet, so you want to now, and that's the interesting thing about chili to copper. That's great. You can actually drop the fish into a, a quarantine tank that's pre-dosed at two parts per million chili to copper. Most species will tolerate that. And then over two to three days, raise it up to 2.5, which is therapeutic. And then you want to treat it that concentration for 30 days. Now, while the fish is in uh, 2.5 copper power, you want to dose you know, I, I say metronidazole, but CCHEM, the medication is CCHEM Metroplex. Metronidazole is just the active ingredient. You want to dose that every 48 hours for 10 days. It's some During that 30-day period, it, at some point, you want to dose metronidazole every 48 hours for 10 days. So by doing that, in 30 days, you've treated for ick, velvet, and brook. Um, and then after 30 days, you want to remove the copper from the water, get it as close to zero as possible, and then you want to deworm. So most people use a medication called Prozipro, which contains Proziquantil. And you would dose that um, after the 30 days in copper, you would dose that twice about a week apart. So while you're, so basically the whole process takes about six weeks, six to eight weeks, depending on how long you want to observe for. 30 days in copper with, with Metro uh, dosed in the water. And then afterwards, you would want to do the two rounds of Prozipro. But then during that time, you're also observing to ensure that all diseases have been eliminated because, you know, just like with us, there's no, you know, I tell people you can't put a person in a hospital for a month or two and cure them of any and all diseases right. or sometimes it just don't work. So that's why no matter what you do, you want to do a post-treatment observation period to be sure that you actually, the fish is in fact disease free before you put the fish in your DT. You never want to take a fish right out of copper, for example, and put it right in your DT and just hope that the treatment was successful because, you know, mistakes can and will happen. Murphy's Law kicks in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a quick question, uh, Sammy31D, favorite copper test kit? The Hannah Checker, hands down. 
Um, Hannah makes a high range copper checker that's been tested for salt water and it's accurate within uh, 0.05 ppm, hands down. I mean, I I mean, it's so much better to sit there and you you, uh, you you're getting the number off the Hannah checker you can read versus you know because all the other test kits are it's, it's they're color test kits. So you know you're kind of sitting there and you're trying to match the color versus the chart and like a lot of people are colorblind and don't even realize it. So yeah, I just tell people use the Hannah checker. So you went, uh, you, you described in terms of the quarantine process and, and uh, the length and the meds that you should be using. What if you get a fish from, you know, a place that has already run a fish, you know, their fish through the quarantine process, right? You mentioned at the beginning of the stream that there are a number of online um, vendors out there or, or just a number of um, companies that sell fish that um, do have condition quarantine fish. Should you trust those places or no? It depends on the place. Um, I actually wrote an article about this. I called it, you know, actual versus half-baked quarantine. So the problem with quarantine is it's become now a catchphrase in the hobby. You know, everybody's like, why quarantine? I quarantine. Well, you know, there's different levels of quarantine and there's, 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 there's people who say they quarantine, they don't quarantine. I, I would recommend it, it from most places you buy from, unless you absolutely, you know, trust the the company and their process, you want to at the very least set up an observation tank and you at least want to put the fish uh, in an observation tank for two to four weeks to be sure there's more, uh, no diseases. On my forum, we actually have a list of quarantine vendors. Hmm. There's about half a dozen that I've, I have actually vetted. Um, a lot of them, I, I work with them on a pretty consistent basis. So they're the ones that I trust. They're the ones that I trust. They're the ones I promote. They're the ones that I feel are doing the most thorough uh, quarantine in the industry. People want to go to Humble.Fish and look that up. Um, and those are the ones that I put my name and my reputation behind. But for any others, I, I'm not saying that they don't do a quarantine just because I don't endorse them. I'm just saying you want to at the very least put the fish in an observation tank for a couple of weeks to be sure the fish is disease free. Do you know the uh, Do you know the uh, the six off the top of your head? Um, I can look it up. Okay. It's uh, yeah. Hold on, my I'm, cu I'm curious. So the ones and and look, I've I've had to remove some because if they don't do the job, I mean, I just I get rid of them. I only I'm only going to keep vendors on my forum that I trust. So right off the top of the list is. And how do you um how do you eliminate them? I mean, how, how what what kind of criteria are you using to kind of put them on this uh, list? So let me just read yeah, these off. The, so Alien Reef Aquatics, uh, Ethical Aquatics, which he's in Canada only. So if you have any listeners in Canada, that's who you can buy from. Fish Hotel, Ocean Devotion, uh, Terror Reef Aquaculture in the Wild Zone. The last two primarily um, they focus on. Um, uh, they focus on quarantine corals and the other ones, the first four I read, uh, focus on, on quarantine fish. So basically the way it works is I vet them by, um, when, when I, you know, I talk to the owners, uh, we talk about their process. Obviously I'm not actually there to, to make sure they're doing what they say they're going to do. But, you know, as long as they, they say the right things, um, and they're, they're following my quarantine protocols and everything seems to line up, they get approved. Um, however, if I start getting complaints about their fish, like I, you know, people are buying fish from them and they're getting diseases or, or, well, the other thing is if they're not providing, uh, the vendors are not providing good customer service, if there's problems with communication, obviously I, I try to work with the vendor, um, to resolve the issues. But if the issues can't be resolved, then I have to remove them as a vendor, because I'm only going to put my name behind vendors. Basically, I'm only going to put my name behind vendors that I would buy from and put the fish right into my display tank. If I don't feel confident about that with the vendor, then I have to remove them from the list. It, has it changed over the years? You know, um, Bobby, I mean, I, I used to like exclusively buy my fish from, from one online vendor. I'm not going to name the names and all that stuff. And um, well, I guess I can. I mean, you've named names, so... <laughs> live aquaria right i mean i, I think everybody right, yeah. used to buy fish from live aquaria but then they changed ownership um a few times and and um then i started having bad experiences um you know with them 
uh, is it um, is it tough for the for the really large online vendors to to kind of have those quarantine? I mean, all the vendors that you just rattled off, I never heard of them. You know? Yeah, they're they're small. They're a lot of them are just garage vendors. Uh, they're just doing it out of their basement. Um, they're not they're not the big ones that you're used to hearing. Um, I think, in my opinion, when if you try to quarantine on a large scale. It's hard to do because something's going to slip through the cracks. I mean, you got so much going on. You've got, you know, fish coming and going and it, it just gets very difficult um, to keep track of everything. So it kind of seems like so far anyway, the most successful quarantine vendors, meaning the ones that aren't you're going to buy fish from and they're going to be, in fact, disease free are the smaller, um, um, you know, homegrown vendors that are just still doing it out of their house or out of their basement or they have a very small uh, retail space. But to answer your question, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's horrible now. Um, you know, I can remember, I mean, like I said, I never, I mean, back in the eighties, nineties, I didn't quarantine. There wasn't, I mean, I would get ick or something in the tank, but it wasn't, I never got anything that I couldn't manage. Right. right? right. And I don't know exactly what is going on nowadays. I have some theories, but the disease problems are so much worse than they were just 10, 20 years ago. Mm. And mm. I don't have a, an answer. I have some theories, but I don't know for sure why that is, but it just seems like it is so difficult um, not to get a fish that doesn't have a disease. So that's why I kind of like I'm a champion of aquaculture, you know, like places like biota, because, you know, these fish seem to be healthier. They're not being taken out of the ocean with the diseases. They're being bred in a, um, um, you know, in a, in a, in a facility. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that as aquaculture becomes more and more of a thing, then we we will see less and less fish disease. Now I say that, however, anytime you're in like a Petco or something, go walk over to the freshwater section and all those fish are aquacultured and they have ick and all kind of other diseases as well. So, I mean, I think it's kind of a thing where if a dealer gets a disease or a wholesaler gets a disease in their system, I mean, in their facility, they're really not going to do what it takes to to eliminate that problem because you know the fish are only there for a very limited you know amount of time and they just move them down the supply chain. But uh, but yeah, it's it's horrible. I I used to buy all my fish from Divers Den. Yep, you me know, too. Back when all my fish came from Divers Den. I do not believe I've ever lost a fish from Divers Den. But then something has changed. Yes, yes. Yeah, I heard that um, something changed in that. Um, off of live aquaria, if you buy if you buy the fish off the divers, then that they're they're more likely to 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 come in in better shape than versus uh, not being on divers then on live aquaria. You know, I I don't know. I, I think that's a lot of anecdotal um um you know things that I've read about. I I have no, and you know, I in terms of my own personal experience, I guess I've had better luck with the divers then versus um you know just uh, fish that come from the west coast from uh, live Quarry versus the Wisconsin facility. Right. Well, they did a um, diver's den because they were in, in Wisconsin. They did a, a quarantine. Um, I'm not really privy to what exactly their, their protocol was. I do know that is a Kevin Cohen used to be the, the, he ran the, yeah. the diver's den facility and he's no longer with the company. So maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but yeah, it's just not the same. It's, it's not what it used to be. I would, I mean, even if you bought a diver's den fish, I'd still quarantine. I would at least observe it. You know, I would just put it right in my tank. I mean, is, is the best thing for us hobbyists to do is to actually go to our local fish stores and, and see the fish live and in person and to um, look for certain signs that it is healthy, that it's eating, you know, versus buying online. I mean, I, I live in a remote area in Vermont. So for me, I really don't have a lot of options in terms of being able to shop for fish in person. So I'm really very much um limited to buying online and i you know i i do try to 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 purchase from online vendors that i think seem to be reputable and i've had good experiences with but um it's it's you know for people that do have the option for a local fish store is that a better play than buying a fish online oh absolutely i mean if you have a local fish store that you know is a good local fish store that's within driving distance by all means support them because you can go there, you can see the fish, you, you know exactly what you're getting. To me, one of the most important things is you can see that fish eat. 
You can ask the dealer to, you know, add food um, to the tank. You can see the fish eat before you buy it. Don't leave the local fish store unless you have the food in hand that you saw the fish eat. Um, and this is going to sound a little, little ridiculous, but you can actually, like, if the fish is friendly enough to actually swim close to the glass, you can actually, and I, I do this, you can take, like, a magnifying glass and against the, and you can actually look at the fish and you see so many things with a magnifying glass that you would not see with the naked mm. eye. So there's like little things like that that you can do. You can you you can see how the fish is acting. You can see if they're breathing heavy. You can see if they're scratching. You 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 can you know and you know if you live really close, you can actually go back you know every day and you know see how the fish is doing before you make your purchase. So let's say you go to your local fish store and they have a fish that is like you know the top of your list in terms of fish that you want to like add to your uh, reef tank you know it's kind of like the um the holy grail fish that you've been after and um you know the price is reasonable whatever but the fish is not eating stay away from it i would yeah i mean an eating fish is i mean a fish that is not eating is bad news i mean there's a reason the fish is not eating it could just be the fish just arrived you know a lot of fish that just arrive from either a wholesaler or from a, um, a collector or whatever are not going to usually eat straight away. Um, could be the, the food that the, that the, um, the local fish store is offering. The fish just won't eat that. You know, there's certain species like a regal angel is a good example. I mean, uh, I they're love not regals, <laughs> but they're picky. You know, they're, they're, they're real picky about what they'll eat. Sometimes you have to use like live black worms. Sometimes you have to use live brine shrimp. Sometimes you have to use like a clam on the half shell. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I tell people, unfortunately, if you buy a fish that's not eating, you're asking for trouble because there's no guarantees whether you quarantine or not that that fish is going to start eating once it's in your um, once it's under your care. Um, ACA Agriculture support your local fish store if you have one close. Amen, for sure. Uh, what about um, Bobby? What was the uh, question I, I was looking at in the uh, the chat oh yeah kevin johnson is it necessary to quarantine captive bred fish from sources like biota and an ora I, I would still at least do an observational um quarantine the reason being is um all of the facilities that i know of that are doing the aquaculture they're using uh, natural seawater um now I, I know like in some cases it's heavily filtered or they use like uv sterilizer to eliminate as many pathogens from the water as they can however i still feel it's prudent to at least put the fish um you know in an observation tank for at least a couple of weeks you know power feed it what i mean by that feed it multiple times a day to really you know build it up um just observe for diseases before you put that fish um, um in your dt but it's probably the safest place if you're just gonna forego all quarantine or observation and put the fish directly into your dt then probably buying from a, a facility like biota is going to be your safest bet um what about uh you know a situation where um well here's a simple question do all fish have some sort of disease what well, you know what they do, actually. So for, well, I mean. And, 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 and you know, and, yeah. and is it just a matter of like, do all fish have some sort of parasites or something like that? And it's just a matter of them going under enough stress for those, um, you know, parasites or that disease to show itself. I, so I say this, I say all fish probably have diseases because I'll just use viruses are, are the best example. So just like with us, um, with fish, there are no cure for viruses in fish. For example, the most common is lymphocystis. There's a, a fish virus known as lymphocystis. It actually lives inside the fish's body. The symptoms that you will see are it's sort of like a cottony growth like on their fins and spines. Um, even once symptoms subside, the fish, just like if you have COVID, you have, I mean, the virus lives inside you for life. So just like with COVID, if a fish has a virus like lymphocystis, that fish is always going to have that virus and is always capable of, of sharing that virus um, with other fish. So for that reason, I'll say technically, yes, um, all fish have diseases. I would say a high, a very high um, likelihood that any fish you buy, especially if it's a, a wild caught, is going to have something. It's going to have ick. It's going to have velvet. It's going to have flukes. Um, the odds of encountering a 
um, a, a, you know, a fish that doesn't have parasites or worm that's that's nowadays seems to be almost non-existent. So it really comes. So that, that, that's that's a really good thing because like. I tell people, look, the, the question isn't really whether or not you want to quarantine because that's a personal choice. Some people quarantine, some people don't. I just try to stress to people, realize that any fish you buy, there's a high likelihood it's going to have a disease, it's going to have parasites, it's going to have worms. So do one of two things. Either quarantine the fish or if you choose to forego quarantine, um, have what I call a disease management um, um, in place in your DT to handle it. You know, have run a UV sterilizer or ozone. Uh, feed really well. You know, Paul, I'm sure covered that. Have something in place in your DT to aid the fish in managing the the parasites and worms that they're going to inevitably bring into your tank. Um, myth is this a myth that um, a reef tank fish will be less likely to show uh, signs of disease in a reef tank versus a fish only tank? Is that a myth? That fish will be less likely to show diseases in a in a reef yeah, environment, right? Like uh, you know, in a mixed reef system or something like that, versus a fish only um, you know setup. I I would say yes because in a in a reef tank, so it's not that the fish are are healthier. It's that in a reef environment, the fish are in a more natural environment. They're more comfortable in that environment, probably versus like a fish only system. So because the fish is in a natural environment, they're going to be less stressed. Um, a fish is less stressed, is less likely to show signs of disease, is like, less likely to succumb to disease. So kind of like, again, back to our own bodies, you know, um, if you're stressed out and if you get a virus or, or something, you're, you're more likely to have more severe symptoms than if you're not stressed out and you're healthy. So probably fish in a reef environment would be less stressed out and they would be more comfortable in their, their surroundings. So they would be less likely to show symptoms. With, um, with, with the, um, you know, the, the, the big um, thing these days is to have open, open uh, aquascapes, right. To, to have a, a lot less rock than we used to in our reef tanks. Is that, is that a lot more stressful for, uh, for fish because there's fewer hiding spots? Probably so. Um, you know, fish like, being, you know, fish like being able to hide. They like being able to go behind rocks. You know, if you ever notice at night when you turn the lights out, every fish has their own little favorite sleeping cave or, or what have you. So if you if, if you don't have that, if you, you minimize that for the fish, then the fish doesn't feel as, as protected. And also fish start fighting. Because then what happens if you don't have enough, you know, I'll just call them sleeping caves in your tank, then all the fish want the one or two that are left and they start fighting with each other. And that's another thing that, that brings out disease in fish is if fish are fighting that, you know, stresses them out and then it's symptoms of diseases are more likely to present themselves and they're more likely to be severe. What about, um, you know, tangs together in a tank? You know, I've um, I've always put tangs in together at the same time because they'll uh, they'll start kind of fighting if you um, they'll they'll be a certain pecking order, right? If you put one tang in first and then possibly another tang in afterwards, then uh, that first tang might um, you know start picking on the uh, on the second tang. And uh, you know, I've had a situation where I've put you know a, a group of tangs in together, not necessarily the same type of tang, and then after a few years, one tang just turns against the other tang. Is is that um, is that something where uh, you have to be careful in terms of putting in, uh, you know, fish like that and 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 making sure that they're not going to eventually um, turn on each other? You know, I tell people just what just what you said. If you're gonna um, add tangs to your tank, I have to say two things: add them last, and also try to um, if you're gonna quarantine them, quarantine them all together and add them into your DT. Um, at the same time, make sure that they're, you know, about the same size and everything. So basically, like you're saying, the fish all go into the DT on equal footing. Nobody's the boss. Nobody's established. They're all kind of in the tank and they, they kind of, you know, work out like a pecking order. Now, unfortunately, especially with certain tangs like, uh, you know, probably the most notable are like powder blues and Achilles and, and, and that genre of tang, I mean, genus of tang, they will sometimes just as they and this is another theory of mine i think fish when fish are juveniles they have less reason to fight i think once fish grow up and they've been in your tank for several years and they sexually mature i think that's a game changer for fish mm -hmm. i think at that point fish that are sexually mature are looking to breed um and 
that changes their their disposition. So that's sometimes when the um, when the problems really kick in. You know, for example, I've had a powder blue tang that I got and for years, you know, it was a small specimen. The fish was fine. Then you know, you kind of see they they take on that growth spurt and they get to be a six, seven, eight inch powder blue tang. And they turn into a killing machine. Yeah, I had a powder blue yeah. that freaking wigged out. It was the last tang I added. And the the thing freaking, it was like a terror, like I'd never seen before. It actually got um, vertical stripes on, you know, yep. vertical stripes like appeared on the side of this fish because it got so pissed off at uh, whatever I put in that tank, like new fish, even the current fish. It was like something I'd never seen before in my life. And, and that was like, you know, one of the last fish I had added to that tank, but man, what a disaster that was. Yeah, they, they, I mean, in my opinion, again, I don't, this is anecdotal. I, I can't prove this. I think that's a fish that reached sexually mature, sexual maturity. They're wanting to breed that that's, you know, an instinct that they have. They're not able to, and they just get frustrated and just act out. I mean, they're, they're just, or maybe it's a territorial thing where they're like, okay, you know, everybody get out of my area of the reef, and obviously the other fish have nowhere to go because they don't understand that they're in a glass box. So um, going back to uh, uh, preventative measurements here, uh, Sammy 31 d has got an interesting question. I've heard about this. I've, I've never done this, but uh, thoughts on freshwater dips. You know, you get a fish from a um, local fish store online, and instead of doing, I guess, a quarantine, you do a freshwater dip for like a minute or something like that. So I recommend five minutes. Five minutes, okay. um, Yeah, five-minute freshwater dip. So five-minute freshwater dip will provide temporary relief. It won't 100% eliminate anything, but it will provide temporary relief for like diseases like velvet and brook. Um, actually, it's interesting with flukes, a five-minute freshwater dip. So remember I said that flukes are opaque? Well, when flukes are exposed to full freshwater, they actually turn white and fall off the fish. So a freshwater dip is a good diagnostic tool to use on a uh, fish that has flukes because they'll turn white, they'll drop off the fish, you'll see them settle at the bottom. They look like little white sesame seeds, so then you know that the fish um, has flukes. Um, but I tell people not all fish tolerate a freshwater dip well. There are things that you can do to increase the chances. Um, oxygenate the water for 30 to 60 minutes before doing the freshwater dip. Make sure it's temperature controlled. Um, some fish tend like tangs will, will lay down in a freshwater dip. They'll just sort of like go on their side and lay down, you know, so, so kind of like stick your finger in there and chase the fish around a little bit. You know, you want to keep them, keep them moving, keep them breathing. Um, if the fish shows an adverse reaction, once you put them back in the tank, um, I like to use rubber gloves and you just kind of hold the fish in front of a power head that's on low, just cause you're just trying to get that salt water back, you know, flowing through their gills to get their equilibrium back and everything. Um, and the other thing with um, a freshwater dip is the pH. So as long as the water is alkaline, you're not going to have a problem. But, you know, some people live in areas where their 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 freshwater is acidic. Um, so when I'm starting to tell people, if you live in an area of the country that has pH or alkaline freshwater, it's probably better to use dechlorinated tap water to mm. do a freshwater dip than it is RODI. Because RODI is sometimes, I think it's supposed to be exactly um seven but i don't know if you ever try to test ph on rodi you don't really get much of a reading it's kind of tricky so dechlorinated tap water is best to use if you live in a place that has more alkaline you know hard fresh water tap water so here here's something that i was going to bring up and and uh, unreefer uh is posed this question and this is a good topic if you had to choose to manage disease in a dt um would you choose large UV versus a uh, or a powerful ozone? Um, go ahead, there, Bobby. That's kind of tricky. You know, I, I don't have as much experience managing as I do, like using management tools like that, as I do with quarantine. I probably would go with ozone over uh, UV because with with a UV sterilizer. Um, I guess I just I would go with the ozone because it's oxidation and I'm I'm a more of a believer in oxidation than I am, you know, just siphoning out the parasites and hoping that the UV lamp kills them. Um, there are other management tools. There's a, a diatom filter is a good example. They actually there's some people that actually will plumb in a pool grade diatom filter into their into their plumbing. Hmm. And then what happens is the theory is that the um, the parasites are get trapped in the diatomaceous earth that you put in the diatom filter. 
Um, I was actually just talking today with a, um, a breeder who uses micron filters. I think uses like a 0.5 micron filter to filter out parasites. So the whole the whole like managing diseases, it's to me, it's a it's a it's a two prong attack, right? You want to first, you want to keep the number of parasites down in the tank. So that's when the management tools come into play, like a UV or an ozone or a diatom filter or whatever. And you simultaneously want to boost the fish's immune systems to deal with whatever parasites um, that survive. And that's when when um, proper nutrition, like Paul, I'm sure was talking about last week, uh, comes into play. But to answer that question, I probably would go with ozone over a UV sterilizer. Do you, do you think it uh, it makes sense to use a a UV in a reef tank? You know, I've um, I've started using UV to uh, for a couple of different reasons. One is because I thought you know it 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 can help, I guess, with some of the um, the uh, uh, the fish disease that uh, does get into the water column, and uh, you know, two also just it's a good preventative measure in terms of um, preventing uh, you know dinos in a reef tank, at least if you have the uh, the free floating variety. But uh, do you do you uh, see any harm running UV twenty four seven on a reef tank? I don't see any harm in it. I mean, it's gonna. You're not like I said. I don't. I don't believe that a, uh, enough biodiversity lives in the water to really like negatively impact your tank. But definitely running a UV um, at the proper flow rate will remove algae spores from the water. Um, can re- like you said, if you have like dinos in the water, it can it can remove those. Um, there actually was a study recently done on actually for the first time marine ick, um, that like, uh, I forget exactly what the flow rate was and everything, but they've actually proven that, a um, I think actually, you know what, I'm probably mixing this up. It probably was ozone. It wasn't a UV sterilizer. They proved that ozone actually can kill marine ick. But I think, I think a UV sterilizer is, is definitely a useful tool. Actually, I saw in the chat, Vince Love Fish, which is a great member that's on my forum, uh, he said UV and peroxide. So there's, I'm not doing this experimentation. There's a lady on my form. She's my co-admin. Her name is Jessica. And what she is doing is she's been experimenting with, um, and there's a lot of other people too, that have been experimenting with dosing hydrogen peroxide into the water. Again, peroxide being an oxidizer um, to uh, treat fish parasites. And it, there, it, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. It works for some people. Some people it doesn't. But actually combine running a UV sterilizer while you're dosing peroxide actually makes the peroxide more effective mm. at oxidizing mm. parasites. So that's a good combination to run, running a UV with hydrogen peroxide. So thank you, Vince, for reminding me of that. Yeah, we're getting several folks commenting about uh, running the UV and, and the uh, the peroxide. Um, Reef Keeper's got a question. What about safety stop? I don't even know what safety stop is. I know Mark Levinson talks about it all the time. Know anything about that, Bobby? So safety stop is basically part A is formalin, part B is methylene blue, um, and it, it's I mean it's 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 a it's a very good in my opinion. Uh, just I'm going off the active ingredients. Formalin is excellent for removing surface parasites off fish. Methylene blue is excellent for um, if a fish has bacteria. Um, it's very good if a fish has ammonia burn, um, any kind of toxicity issues with the fish, methylene blue is great for. Um, so if whether you're going to use it as a, a bath, whether or not you're putting the fish in quarantine or in your DT, I think it's an excellent uh, thing to use. My only issue, and they won't answer me, is I've reached out to the manufacturer. I would like to know what, because I'm a, I'm a technical guy and I like to know the details. I would like to know what percentage of formaldehyde and methanol that they put in their their part A, the formalin product, because proper formalin is 37% fault from all the hide mixed with 10 to 15% methanol. I would just like an assurance that it is that formulation. They won't answer me. I've emailed them repeatedly. Um, so that's my only issue with safety stop is I cannot guarantee that the formalin is the proper concentration that you would need to remove um, at least, you know, the majority of like velvet or brook or flukes on a fish. Um, <clears throat> a couple more specific questions in terms of uh, treatments. This one uh, is um, from Tohi. What is the latest information on treating it with hydrogen, per- hydrogen uh, peroxide? I remember it was a potential treatment at 1 ml per 10 gallons of water, but wasn't confirmed. Do you know, um, Bobby, if there's a certain concentration in terms of the peroxide? 
So the there's a whole there's a thread on my forum called uh, um, uh, treating parasites with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, all the people on that thread are just using three percent hydrogen peroxide that you just buy at like Walmart or any drugstore. I believe the way they do it is like I said, it's not really that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I believe what they're doing is they're dosing like one ml per. It's either per eight or ten gallons. Uh, every 12 hours and then they're doing that continuously and then they're basically as you're getting the corals and inverts more used to the peroxide they're ramping it up to like maybe one ml per six gallons or one ml per eight gallons and they're doing it every eight hours and they're doing running the uv sterilizer to make the peroxide more toxic they're also using um, dosers to do overnight dosing so that you're slowly releasing the peroxide into the water because um at night should be when the peroxide should be most effective because it doesn't get broken down by the aquarium lights. Um, so yeah, there's a whole long thread on my forum about in what I call in tank peroxide dosing. Um, and it's got all the, the dosages laid out and the times and everything. And, uh, um, like I said, it works for some people. It seems to work best if symptoms are caught early on. So if you start noticing some white dots on your fish and you're like, okay, let me jump on this you seem to have a better outcome than if you wait until all the fish are covered and they're they're heavily diseased and then you try the peroxide dosing and sometimes it's too little too late. What, what are some of the dangers in terms of peroxide dosing for a reef tank? You know, obviously if you overdose, what are, uh, what, what are the risks there? Um, so the, so most corals seem to tolerate, of course, you know, it is an oxidizing agent, so it has the potential to kill your corals and inverts. Um, however, it seems like most corals tolerate it. It seems like the inverts that it would be most sensitive to it would be uh, like snails, urchins, starfish, you know, those inverts that are that are sensitive to any changing water chemistry. So sometimes the peroxide dosing uh, will kill those. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think I've read maybe one time someone said they lost an anemone uh, while treating with peroxide, but it seems mostly well tolerated by most species of corals and inverts. I don't know if you remember, but before they were using it to treat parasites, people were doing the peroxide dosing to treat nuisance algae. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So this is basically the same thing. It's a six-week program um, of dosing peroxide, and instead of using it to eliminate nuisance algae, you're, you're using it to try to eliminate, you know, fish parasites. Um, what about, um, Bobby needing to remove a fish from a tank to treat it for disease, you know, is that something that, um, you need to do depending on the type of disease? And, um, if so, what is the best way to do that in a reef tank? Cause, uh, obviously they have a lot of hiding spots. So you talk, are you talking about like removing a fish to quarantine it or just do a temporary relief thing and put it back uh, in? Yeah, the... e either or, you know, it can be to, um, to get it out of there and try to, to treat it, I guess, in a quarantine tank or, or to try to uh, resolve, um, you know, something that's going on that's, you know, not making the fish uh, happy. Um, so, I mean, obviously the biggest problem is, is trying to catch the fish with all the rocks. Um, you, you can try to use like a fish trap. Um, I mean, you know, they sell those acrylic, uh, fish traps you can use. I actually make, I just build my own using that, you know, that egg crate stuff. Um, I just make like little box, um, uh, uh, you know, fish traps and you can put like some bait in there or whatever for it. And then I actually just run fishing line back over to the couch and just wait for the fish to go in, pull the fishing line. It shuts a trap door, um, for smaller fish is what they call the bottle trap which is where you take like a, like a, like a Coke bottle and you cut off the top and then you sort of invert it, put it back in and then the fish and, you know, put food inside like some mice or shrimp. The fish goes inside and kind of gets confused how to get, you know, find the hole to get back out. Um, so once you get the fish out, um, it really depends what disease they have as far as doing like, like I tell people, you know, you want to give the fish temporary relief before you put it in quarantine. So for example, if you were, say you had a fish with velvet or Brooklynella, um, you could use formalin uh, to provide temporary, like a 45-minute formalin bath. You could actually use a 30-minute um, hydrogen peroxide bath. And that I like to promote that because that's something in an emergency situation, anybody can go run to Walmart or a drugstore and just buy 3% USP grade H202. 
Uh, the dosage for that, because you want to give them a bath for 30 minutes at 150 ppm, it's 20 milliliters of 3% H2O2 per gallon of salt water. You would temperature control and aerate the water. And what that will do, that will knock off most surface parasites. It's not going to completely cure the fish and, you know, make the fish well and, and, and get every single thing, but it will, it will knock off the vast majority of the parasites so that you are worms that you can put the fish then in a quarantine tank and do follow-up treatment with, you know, the medications we talked about before, copper, metro, prosy, um, depending upon the situation. Um, there are other products out there. Um, I think I saw somebody in the chat mention Ruby Reef Rally. That's a great product to use because it contains formalin and two antiseptics. So that's especially useful if you have a fish with a bacterial issue, like a bacterial infection, and you need to provide temporary relief before you can put the fish in QT and treat, you know, dose antibiotics. Um, but those are the main ones I would say. Ruby Reef Rally is good. Formalin is a good one. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, of course, you know, freshwater dip works too. If you just want to, you don't want to use any medications, you can do a five minute freshwater dip. That will dislodge most parasites and worms from a fish's gills. It'll tell you if the fish has flukes. So those are all options for, for what I call temporary relief before you can put the fish in QT and do a, a proper treatment. Uh, freshwater dips freak me out. You know, I just, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know if I have the, um, the metal for, for, for doing freshwater dips, but obviously you got to just, uh, go on what, um, you know, people say, and, and, and um, the, the experts like yourself are saying a five minute uh, freshwater dip is fine. Then you gotta, you gotta trust that. Um, just a couple of comments here in terms of catching fish. Vince loves fish, black out the room and flip the just red LEDs has worked like a charm for me. Stones most fish. And uh, John Reaver, Vermont, teach your fish to eat from nets. Best approach ever. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I've also seen those red nets, uh, those, you know, those red infrared nets that some people use huh. to catch fish. I don't know. Um, the, the, the theory is that, especially at night, the fish can't see the red. So, you know, I don't know if that works or not, but I've seen some people recommend that. Um, so Bobby, you, you mentioned um, um, bacteria-related diseases. What, what percentage of the diseases would you say are bacteria-related? And um, can you kind of also help us understand what the uh, bacteria-related diseases are? My understanding is that there's a thing called gram-negative bacteria that are the bacteria that typically cause the, uh, the disease in fish. So um, I guess the follow-up question would be, what's the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive um, bacteria? So most freshwater fish are afflicted by gram-positive bacteria. Most uh, saltwater fish, marine fish, are going to be afflicted by gram-negative. Um, you can actually, it's a little technical, but you can actually do what they call a gram-staining test. You can take like a small um, like scrape or biopsy from the fish where, where you see the infection. You can do gram-staining, and it will stain either purple or pink for gram-positive or, or gram-negative. So the vast majority of marine infections are going to be gram-negative, and the vat, this, this is the kicker about bacterial infections. That, that's one of the things you really can't keep out of a tank. Bacteria is everywhere, yeah. and harmful bacteria is, is in, in almost every tank. So the question is, well, then why aren't all these fish having bacterial infections? And I think what happens is if, if, it's, if it's a healthy fish and it's healthy, it's not injured, I think most fish, their natural immune system, is it, it, they're capable of fighting off an infection. What happens, though, is if a fish is fighting, I guess what you call like a, a pre-existing parasitic or worm infestation, if a fish has ichor velvet, and their immune system is already tied up um, um, fighting that off, plus the, the what they call the trophons, which are actually the parasites on the fish feeding on the fish, as they're feeding on the fish, they leave these tiny little holes. So you kind of have like this perfect storm of a fish with, with a um, reduced immune system, are the immune systems tied up, already fighting off these parasites? And then you got a fish swimming around with these tiny little holes. Well, then what that does is opens the way for like opportunistic, like um, uh, harmful bacteria mm -hmm. to then you get a bacterial infection. It's the same thing if you have an open cut on your skin and, you know, you, you know, it, you get dirt or whatever on or whatever. Or you come in contact with harmful bacteria, you can get an infection on your skin. Same thing. Everything that applies to human medicine applies to fish medicine. So when the fish are, are, their immune systems are tied up fighting off parasites and worms, 
that's prime time to get what I call a secondary bacterial infection. And then once that happens, your chances of successfully treating the fish diminish greatly because now you're, you're dealing with parasites, you're dealing with bacteria, you're having to mix medications. And uh, another thing that, that causes bacterial infections, I hate to admit it, is copper. Copper mm. is an immunosuppressive chemical. So when fish are in, are in copper, it, it lowers their immune system. It makes them more susceptible to a bacterial infection. What, uh, what's one to do with the bacterial infection? So there's a lot of things you can do. So you can either do a bath or you can do in-tank treatment or in a quarantine tank. Um, none of these medications are what I consider to be reef safe. So um, you can do a bath with Rally because that contains the antiseptics that are, are useful um, for our treating a bacterial infection. I think I saw someone on the screen that said, don't ever use peroxide when a fish has a bacterial infection, or especially if like you see redness on the fish, which is one of the symptoms of a bacterial infection because it actually the peroxide irritates that. Um, you, can, you can do um, with antibiotics, you can use antibiotics, you can either use them in a bath treatment or you can dose them into a quarantine tank. Uh, one of the most effective ones is a Cipro, which I know some people are familiar with. They, you know, that's used in other applications. Uh, you can do daily Cipro baths. Um, almost any antibiotic that's out there, you can actually do double, you can do a double dosage bath for 30 minutes. Hmm. Um, then in the quarantine tank itself, you would want to um, dose the antibiotic um, either every 24 or every 48 hours for at least 10 to 14 days. Um, some common ones are like canamycin, neomycin. Uh, I think Seachem makes, they make canaplex, they make neoplex, they make sulfaplex. These are all antibacterial medications which contain those active ingredients. Um, so you, the, the problem with bacterial infections is antibiotics are extremely slow acting in fish, which is why you have to treat for sometimes two or even three weeks to completely knock the infection out because it's not a, not a fast acting cure. Um, a couple more questions then I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. This is a very technical question, uh, Mike, from Mike Campbell. Uh, question for Bobby, since uh, formaldehyde only has a six-month shelf life, does the lower concentration in legit formalin 37% mean the shelf life is less since there is less formaldehyde in it? In my opinion, no, because what happens, so the whole issue with, so here's the thing. So formaldehyde by itself actually lasts a long time. It's when you mix the formaldehyde with the methanol that you have the six-month shelf life. So what happens is after six months, the it then turns into what they call paraformaldehyde, which is a much more toxic form of, of, of formalin. So I would say regardless of, of the concentration, whether you're, you know, because I mean, it's all the way down to like 3% formaldehyde or you're using proper formalin, which is 37% formaldehyde. As soon as you open that, I would, you know, put a date on that bottle. And in six months, I would just throw it away and buy new. You can actually go on Amazon and you can buy, um, I forget what it costs nowadays, but you can buy like a, a bottle of, of formalin, 20, 30 bucks, it'll last you six months. Right. You know, it's just not worth to me, you know, using it beyond that and possibly killing your fish because it's, it's now uh, paraformaldehyde. Gotcha. <clears throat> uh, CB's Reef, how long are the short bath with 20 uh, mLs of 3% peroxide? How, how long for a bath with that? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So, so in a bath, I I prefer using a glass, um, doing it like in a big glass bowl because you know glass is inert. It won't. There's no negative interaction with the peroxide. You can use food food grade plastic, like most buckets are food grade plastic. That would be safe. Um, you can run air. Um, I've done testing in 30 minutes in you know using like an air stone does not um, uh, reduce the concentration of peroxide in the water. Uh, you probably don't need to use a heater if it's only 30 minutes, just depending, you know, as long as you're doing it in a, you know, temperature controlled room, um, it's 30 minutes. You can actually go on Amazon and they sell these high range peroxide test strips mm. and you can actually do the test like before and after. And it only reads up to hundred PPM, but anything above 75 PPM peroxide is therapeutic for temporary relief. So as long as you're seeing that the peroxide has maintained a level of 75 ppm or higher for the 30 minutes, you know that it's it's uh, the concentration was successful and you you did a successful peroxide bath. Um, 
So Mike Coppa and Vince Lowe's Fisher are uh, kind of dialoguing back and forth about the importance of water changes in a QC, a QT uh, system. Bobby, what, um, what what would you recommend in terms of uh, water changes and, and um, you know, how much and how often? I think they're important. I mean, even if you don't, obviously they're important for ammonia. So if you have ammonia in a quarantine tank, you know, that's the best way to, to remove it or reduce it is to do a water change. But, uh, but you know, fish in quarantine need clean water. Um, so I think it's very important to keep your quarantine tank very clean, uh, do water changes. A little trick I like to do, um, cause you know, we all get in our quarantine tanks. We'll get like little, um, like uneaten food and fish poop on the bottom. I take like airline tubing and I use that so I can like better target it. So I'm not like removing a ton of water, but I'm siphoning out the uneaten food and the fish poop and everything out of the water and doing replacement. The only thing I'll say about water changes, if you are treating, for example, with copper and your copper level is 2.5, be sure that any replacement water you add back, make sure it's at the same concentration. So you'll literally have to like mix copper in the bucket of water before adding it to the QT. The reason this is so important is once you reach a therapeutic copper level, like 2.5 ppm, you never want it to drop. You want it to stay 2.5 at, at, at all times. So you wouldn't want to put back just freshly mixed salt water that didn't have copper, diluting the concentration and then have to add more copper to raise it because then the fish would have a very brief period where they would not be in therapeutic copper. Some free swimmers could get through, reattach, and you would have a failed quarantine. Gotcha. Some excellent questions out there. Thanks, folks. You know, so uh, Bobby, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Any any final thoughts, man? Um, I, I just I, I guess you know I'm, I know I'm repeating myself here, but I mean for your your viewers, I would say don't don't think you're you're just gonna get lucky. I mean, a lot of people um, get into the hobby and they hear about diseases and quarantine. They're like, oh, I don't have to worry about that. I, you know, I'll just get lucky or I'll. I'll watch, you know, I'll, I'll go to the local fish store and look at the fish carefully before I buy it. Don't, that shouldn't be a plan. Realize that at some point you're going to encounter fish diseases. Now, it's up to you whether you encounter them in a quarantine tank or in your display tank. If you're going to encounter them in a quarantine tank, make sure you have the medications on hand, copper, Metroplex, Prozzi Pro, antibiotics, so that you can treat the fish you don't have to like order them off Amazon and wait however long it takes to get them in. You can treat the fish immediately. If you choose to forego quarantine and just put the fish right in your DT, I would um, suggest that you you do a bath. So like, you know, safety stop, you know, where you do the formalin, the methylene blue, do a bath to knock off most of the parasites before the fish go in your DT and invest in a management tool, UV sterilizer, ozone, diatom filter, and May, no matter what you do, don't skimp on nutrition. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we spend thousands of dollars on controllers and pumps and all this other stuff. Make sure you are feeding your fish properly. Remember, things like clams, mice's shrimp, uh, uh, muzzles, uh, shrimp. I mean, that's what they need to eat. And also, unless, unless you buy it pre-mixed, I highly encourage uh, lacing the fish food with probiotics, vitamins, beta glucan, amino acids, anything that will, you know, just kind of like we're supposed to be eating that will improve our immune system. You want to feed your fish healthy foods to basically boost their immune system to, you know, handle the diseases that are going to make it into your DT if you're not quarantining. If, um, if you don't have the time to make your own, um, you know, fish food, what um, manufactured brand out there do you like? I like uh, LRS Foods. Um, he, he puts, I think two or three different strains of probiotics in the food. Um, you can go on his website and you can look at the ingredients and he's got it all laid out, you know, the clams and all the different ingredients he puts in his food. Um, so he's probably my favorite, probably nothing wrong with Rod's food. I don't use it personally, but I've looked at the ingredients. It looks similar, uh, to LRS. I think there's another one called Rogers food. Um, I really like the PE mysis. Mm. Um, those are the larger mice of shrimp because if you go look at them, they're like 70% protein. So that's very good for the fish. You know, the, the cool thing about fish is, you know, we can control their diet. You know, we can tell them exactly what they're going to eat. So kind of like we should be doing for ourselves, we can make sure that they only eat healthy foods, which help, uh, promote their, their immune systems. So, uh, so yeah, if you can't make yourself LRS, Rogers food, Rod's food, um, 
you know, are probably the best to buy that most local fish stores will carry. Or you can buy them online. We're getting a lot of a lot of kudos for LRS food from the uh, from the viewers. So, um, all right, Bobby. So yeah, folks, if you haven't already, please check out Bobby's uh, forum humble dot fish. It's a uh, it's a great um, place to uh, you know a lot of a lot of interesting discussions going on there. So uh, please check it out. And uh, well, Bobby, I want to uh, thank you, man, for uh, for being on the show. It was uh, it was a lot of fun um chatting with you and i also want to thank both bulk resupply and ecotech marine for sponsoring the live stream and also want to thank all you folks out there for all the great um comments and questions you had finally a big thank you to paul the moderator who's uh, also the president of the boston reefer society please join and support your local reef keeping clubs they are so important to this hobby also want to let you know that all episodes of wrapping the reef bum are available as podcasts on spotify Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Rapping with the Reef Bump live stream will be uh, next Thursday, December 1st. I can't believe it's already December coming up here, but I, I guess I'm skipping a week. So uh, we're uh, taking Thanksgiving week off. It's going to be with uh, Anya Noroski from Gallery Aquatica, which is down under in Australia. So that should be another great show. The full upcoming schedule of guests on... Um, Wrapping on the Reef Bum is available on reefbum.com under the YouTube section. Until next time, be safe, be well. Later. Take care.